So our topic now is ecosystems. And we just watched the film, uh, Our Planet, about forests. And that's narrated by David Attenborough. By the way, um, Adorno was talking about the Siberian tiger and how long it took to get a shot of the Siberian tiger. It was a pretty long time. The film itself started in 2015. It took four years altogether. Uh, four years, 50 countries, and I think 600 crew. So it's really quite an amazing um, series documentary. And it is, it is on Netflix, so it's a, a good place to watch it, and YouTube if you don't have Netflix. So we were deciding that it is important in order to argue the point that carbon dioxide needs to be um, managed, that deforestation needs to be managed, that development needs to be managed. It's important to know how the ecosystems work in the first place, particularly nutrient cycling and carbon dioxide cycling, but other aspects as well. So what, what is an ecosystem? Technically, so an ecosystem is a community of organisms, so all the living or biotic matter and the abiotic variables with which they interact. So we're expanding our view of communities and we're adding the, the um, abiotic factors. That's really super bright here right now. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it because the sun comes right into my, my window over there. I have no covering for it. But that's okay because you're looking at the lecture. Um, ecosystems can be large, um, large lakes, small lakes, entire forests, the boreal forest that uh, David Atborough was talking about is an enormous forest that covers much of the northern hemisphere. It can also be a very small area, like an aquarium is its own sustaining or self-sustained in a way ecosystem, although of course we manage our aquariums. Um, so the scale of an ecosystem is really something that the researcher determines. So the scale of an ecosystem, which, which is the combination of biota, the community of species, and abiotic factors with, with which they interact. And so, When, when we study ecosystems, we're really interested in how energy and matter cycles through that system. And that will also really help us to uh, manage them. So for example, the dynamics of an ecosystem are such that energy flows right through it. Energy flows through. Uh, the ultimate source, what is the ultimate source of energy on the planet? Sun. Sun, good, yeah, the ultimate source is the sun. And the ultimate destination is generally heat. Heat, which is lost. So energy flows, but energy can be converted from one form to another, but it can't be created or destroyed, but it can be converted. Matter, on the other hand, cycles through a system. So it looks something like this. We monitor energy and matter. That's what ecosystem ecologists do. So we might, for example, 
collect data on evapotranspiration rates of forests so that we can measure productivity of forests. Or we may, um, when I was in fisheries, we would monitor salmon populations and how um, deforestation can affect streams, which can affect salmon productivity. Now that's what ecosystem ecologists do. So here's a nice diagram that shows what happens uh, to chemicals, matter. So following blue, um, basically producers are consumed by consumers and then secondary consumers, but all of those decaying and dead organisms get broken down by microorganisms and other detritophores and those nutrients are released back into the system whereby they become nutrients for primary producers. So the nutrients are just always cycling within the system. Energy on the other hand, as you can see, comes from the sun, but at every level, quite a lot of energy is lost as, as heat. Why is it lost as heat? Well, in order to sustain a living organism, um, there must be a lot of chemical reactions, metabolism. And all chemical reactions produce heat as a byproduct. So that's why, for example, if you're cold, you'll probably jump up and down and try to increase your heat. And the reason you can decrease your heat is because there is a more, there are more chemical reactions in the form of muscle contraction. So that's why you lose it. Uh, maybe I should write that down. So heat is lost because metabolism, all chemical reactions of a body, a life form, result in heat as a byproduct of the reaction. And heat is, is merely the disturbance of molecules. So if you were to rub your hands together, for example, do your hands heat up? Would your hands heat up? Yes, they would definitely heat up because you're, you're increasing the movement of molecules on the surface of your hands. And that is what heat is. It's random molecular motion. And the faster the motion, the hotter it gets. So that's why gases uh, tend to be hotter or vaporization occurs at certain temperatures. And that's because uh, vapor is very fast moving. So it can be very warm. So matter cycles through decomposition. Decomposition really connects many of the levels of the food web. Um, detritivores, I personally call bacteria and fungi decomposers. and detritivores, smaller invertebrates and, and um, annelids that break down dead organic material. Decomposers, uh, I feel bacteria and fungi are more classified as decomposers because they uh, use enzymes to digest um, detritus, detritus, which is dead material, outside their cells 
and absorb it. Whereas I think a Detroit of War are things like small invertebrates that consume detritus. In other words, ingest it. So I just wanted to make that distinction. So we're going to talk quite a bit about production. Primary production is the amount of light energy converted to chemical energy by autotrophs during a given time period. And interestingly, um, only, only a fraction of the sun that hits the earth is converted at all. So only a small fraction of solar energy actually strikes photosynthetic organisms. Oh, one of the, and you're probably already thinking of this, I mean, one of the best captures of energy to replace uh, carbon fuels is solar energy. And we're finding ways of capturing it that are really quite clever and ingenious. Um, so capturing, whoops, capturing solar energy um, to replace uh, fossil fuels or carbon fuels is a great advancement. And it used to be quite expensive, but it is getting cheaper to, to make solar panels and things like that. And even some glass can be converted into uh, solar energy um, sinks. So primary production, that's how much energy is converted to chemical energy. So how much production that you're getting. Um, and that production sets the limit for the energy budget of the entire ecosystem. So it is the, the bottom of the food chain. Ah, there it is there. So I'd like to talk about two kinds of uh, primary production in the way we look at budgets of primary production. There's a gross primary production. That is the total production of an ecosystem. But not all of it is stored as organic material in growing plants. Rather, much of it is used for respiration by the primary producers. So that leaves us with a net primary production. And only the net primary production is available to consumers. So primary producers, uh, just in order to maintain themselves, uh, require cellular respiration. Um, so they photosynthesize, of course, and they produce glucose, and they use that glucose in cellular respiration, which gives them energy in the form of ATP, just like all other organisms. So only the net primary production is available to consumers. And I'd like to show you the um, distribution of primary production on the planet. So I hope you can see this okay. Uh, this is net primary production. So, no, I can't, I forgot, I can't do that. This. 
Well, these are three different bar graphs. The first one is the percent of the Earth's surface. So the top bar shows open ocean, and that's 65% of the Earth's surface, 65%. And then this graph goes from the um, highest percentage to the lowest. The next is the continental shelf. That's only 5.2%. Uh, Estuaries, 0.3%. Um, algal beds and reefs and upwelling zones are less. Then on terrestrial systems, uh, desert, rock, sand, and ice, extreme areas are about 4.7%. And um, tropical rainforest is about 3.3%. We looked at the boreal forest, that's 2.4%. And other forests and, and tundra and that is included as well, which are a lower percentage of the earth. What's interesting is looking at the next graph, which shows the average net primary production. So which part of the earth are the greatest producers, the areas where there's the most reproduction and growth. So reproduction and growth happens after uh, the producer has use the energy for its own maintenance. So that's where productivity gets to be net primary productivity. And, you know, we said the ocean was 65% of, net, of, um, of the Earth's surface, but only, this is in grams per square meter per year, 125, grams per square meter per year. So that's quite low considering that the ocean is, covers such a large area. So you can see some of the higher ones. I'll point out some of the higher ones. Um, this is very high, 2,500 grams per square meter per year. And that is due to algal beds and coral reefs. So algal beds, so algae, which are um, primary producers, of course, and coral reefs, which are very productive. Another one here, this 2200, terrestrial, that is the tropical rainforest. So a very, very highly productive area. Fast growth, fast reproduction, no limits to sunshine or rain. So um, NPP, so reproduction and growth after um, energy used for maintenance. Actually, I didn't really want to put that there. That's what NPP is, net primary production. Uh, reproduction and growth after energy used for maintenance. So these two areas very high productivity due to um, Warm temperatures, not like the tundra that has uh, such cold temperatures the whole year. There's permafrost and the growing season is like two weeks. In these tropical areas, the growing season, so the time when productivity is high, is pretty much all year. So warm temperature um, for the terrestrial, uh, no, let's see. Uh, sorry, no limit of rain in the terrestrial systems um, or sun. So 
still very highly productive. Here's another one that's very productive. And that is the swamp and marsh areas. So swamp and marsh areas are where uh, rivers run into the oceans and are low-lying areas where there's also lots of water, so no limit of water. And so um, not always in, in warm temperatures, but if it's by the ocean, it, it will be a temperate kind of a climate. And so lots and lots of growth. And, 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 and the main reason for that large pro productivity is because the rivers and anywhere there where there's swamps are uh, low lying. And that's where all the nutrients flow to. So um, where can I write that? Swamp and marsh. Uh, productive because of low lying elevation and water collection. I don't have room to write this, but I hope you have some room there somewhere to write. Uh, water collection due to uh, water collecting there. So rivers, water from watersheds are bringing not only water, but also nutrients. And that's why they're so highly productive. Maybe I'll just write it over here. With nutrients, it's a very important point. So that's why estuaries are so important for migrating birds. So our Fraser Delta here in um, by Ladner, Richmond, super, super productive. So the Fraser River alone drains a third of British Columbia. So all that silt and sediment is running into the Fraser River eventually, and the Fraser River is bringing that all down to the estuaries, and it's really rich in nutrients. So highly productive area. So some of the lower ones, the, the less productive, well, not surprisingly, the tundra. Maybe I should do that different color. I'll do it in, uh, let's see, red. The tundra, well, because the growing season is not very long. So per year, it's maybe, well, maybe a month or so. So the trees there tend to be really, 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 really tiny. Where else is quite low? This is low here. So those two are extreme desert rock, sand, and ice, and desert and semi-desert scrub. So you would expect that to be low because there's no water. So water and temperature, precipitation and temperature are two of the deciding factors for productivity. Yeah, so looking at the very last graph here, do this in green, graph C. This shows the percentage of Earth's net primary product production. So this is where you multiply the productivity per square meter by the area. So it turns out that the ocean as quite high productivity overall, overall, because it's so enormous. So even though per square meter, it's not very high, but it's such a large area that it provides um, much of the planet's productivity in the whole. And here's another very high one, the tropical forest, also very high. Global net primary production, uh, the contributors are terrestrial and marine, terrestrial about two thirds and marine about one third. And one of the reasons is because of that, for example, enormous 
boreal forest and a lot of the tropical areas along the equator that are highly productive, very productive. So I'd like to look at primary production in marine and freshwater ecosystems. So marine systems and freshwater lakes. Um, what limits production in a watery environment is light penetration. So uh, it affects prime production throughout the photic zone. And we did look at the photic zone in another class, I think, but say this is a lake and this is the sun and the sun's rays are only going to go to a particular depth, perhaps it's this deep. And that's the photic zone. Where the light doesn't penetrate, that's called the aphotic zone. And there can be no primary production there because there's no light. So that's very important. Um, also, limiting nutrients. A limiting nutrient is an element that must be added for production to increase in a particular area. So nitrogen and phosphorus are two um, elements that can limit marine production. I'd like to highlight a study that was done while I was doing my grad work. It wasn't done by me, it was done by my friend Lisa. And this is Kootenai Lake. So we'll do a quick case study of Kootenai Lake. That's in the interior. Um, it is east of Nelson. And it's quite large. It's like 150 uh, kilometers long, I believe. It's also very deep. And it is, it is an important lake, as many of our large lakes are, for fishing, and in particular for kokanee salmon. So there are other species of salmon there. There are um, there are Gerard rainbow trout, which are huge, and there are smaller fishes as well. But people often go there to fish for kokanee salmon. So this is, this is Lisa and she's standing in um, a stream where the kokanee salmon have gathered for spawning. So kokanee salmon are the landlocked um, the landlocked sockeye. So they're the same species as sockeye salmon, but sockeye salmon migrate to salt water. But kokanee do not. Kokanee salmon stay in lakes and migrate into uh, rivers to spawn. And so what was very interesting about this lake, you'll, you'll see here, there's an arm to the lake. And this is quite shallow. There's a bit of a ridge right here. And the rest of the lake is quite deep. And it's an interesting study because the kokanee salmon were overfished. So we do overfish a lot of our fishes. And the, and the kokanee salmon were overfished. But uh, fisheries managers wanted to try and, and increase the productivity of the lake so that the kokanee salmon would increase in number because that productivity goes up food chain. And they decided to add a shrimp called a mycid shrimp. And they had tested this out before on a shallow lake, but not on a deep lake. It seemed to work on the shallow lake. Um, so they added mycid shrimp. 
And then they added it not only to Kootenai Lake, they added it to Arrow Lakes in the interior, which are two enormous lakes that were formed by dams, and Lake Tahoe in the United States, and some other really large lakes. They just added these mice and shrimp. Somebody was like, this is a great idea. <laughs> Seems to work. <laughs> but it didn't work. Added mice and shrimp to increase productivity and salmon numbers. But the salmon crashed. Except for that shallow arm, which lasted a few years. And so in order to understand what's going on there, um, you have to understand the ecosystem. And I think in this case, it wasn't understood well enough. So as in any aquatic ecosystem, the bottom of the food chain are the phytoplankton. And the phytoplankton is consumed by zooplankton. And the zooplankton is consumed by fishes, including kokanee, um, which are consumed by bears and, and fishers. So this is a little bit simplistic. So what they thought would happen is they would add the mice to shrimp, and that would increase the number of zooplankton and increase the number of kokanee. But what they had failed to realize was that zooplankton come in different sizes. So this should look more like small zooplankton, large zooplankton. And it turns out the mice and shrimp are large zooplankton and they feed on the same zooplankton that the kokanee feed on. So all of a sudden, it's not um, a food source for the kokanee salmon, but it's a competition with the kokanee salmon for the smaller zooplankton. So the mice and shrimp ended up being competitors instead of prey. So uh, that's, not, that's not very good. And what was the other thing? The other thing was that was not realized in a deep lake The mice and shrimp migrate down the water column. So here's a lake, and here's the small shrimp. I'm just going to draw dots on the room. And they migrate up and down. And it turns out that the salmon also migrate up and down. They feed up at the surface at dawn and dusk, but unfortunately, it's at a different time than the mice and shrimp. So even though the mice and shrimp can be prey also for kokanee salmon, uh, they were missing them. They were missing them because they migrate at different times through the water column. So it really, it really was um, a big mistake. And what was the other thing? Oh yeah, so in shallow water, the fishery lasted for a little while. And it's interesting because the salmon would gather at this ridge, this ledge. And when the mice did shrimp, let's see what color could we make? We'll make them black. When the mice did shrimp came up, they would be waiting there for them to come up to the, the, the surface at the edge of the shallows there. And then the mice and shrimp would be trapped in the shallow water and they couldn't migrate away to escape from the kokanee. So it's interesting, you know, and it's, and it's complicated. Ecosystems are complicated. They're, they're not straightforward. You, you, you need to know a lot about an ecosystem if you expect to manage it. 
So what do you think? What do you think they should have done? Collected more data first. So what, what should they have done? For example, should they have done more research to determine the place of the mycid shrimp in the food chain? Right? Lots of nods. Yeah, I think I think so too. Yeah, they definitely should have done that. And most importantly, there should have been an experimental study, but not on a shallow lake, but on some experimental deep lakes. Um, that is the best way of determining the effects of something that you're going to add to a lake. Well, my friend Lisa, she became part of a study where they added nutrients to the lake. So she did that, I think, for five or six years, um, going up, going to Kootenai Lake in the summer and adding nutrients and then monitoring the productivity of the phytoplankton and the zooplankton and the fish. And so they wanted to see if there was, if there was a trend, if there was a bottom up um, solution to the problem of the low numbers of kokanee salmon. And the odd thing is they took lot, they gathered lots and lots of data. And it turned out that adding the nutrients did, it did, seem to increase the kokanee salmon numbers, but the exact reason why wasn't determined why that was. You'd think it'd be a straightforward answer, but there wasn't a straightforward answer for that, interestingly. Yeah, so I think I'd like to stop there on that story. I will, we can take it up again next time. Okay, thank you for watching. And I'll just...